Christine, let's start at the far end. Tell us who you're with and what you do. I'm with the Public Utility Commission here in Austin, and I've been there a little over nine years. And I've worked in various roles from rate regulation to competitive markets, and now I'm in the Infrastructure and Reliability Division. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, Carl Popham with Austin Energy. Uh, I'm the manager of Emerging Technologies and Electric Vehicles. Hi, I'm Brad Jones. I'm with the Electric Reliability Council of Texas. I'm the Vice President of Commercial Operations. And good morning, everyone. My name is Rayford Smith. I'm Vice President of uh, Corporate Development and Planning at CPS Energy. And you're a brand new Texas citizen. I am a proud new Texan. <laughs> well, Very good. Well, Ray Bradbury said one time, the uh, science fiction author, when somebody asked him about the book Fahrenheit 451, uh, was he trying to predict the future? And he said, no, I wasn't trying to predict the future. I was trying to prevent it. And uh, I think sometimes we, uh, we would rather prevent the future because it's ugly and kind of uncontrollable. Brad, you've really seen that uh, within, within ERCOT. So Christine, uh, before we get to asking you to make a prediction about the future, what, what do you see as the top one or two or three challenges for electric utilities over the next five to 10 years? What, what do you see the mountain we're about to climb? I think the main challenges that I see, and I don't know that this will be a surprise to, to people, but um, utilities are going to have to be more of an enabler uh, for the industry and for the market. I think um, more customer focused and have to better integrate and there's a regulatory component to this. It isn't just the utilities role, but incorporate demand response, microgrids, and distributed generation, and deal with all of the additional participants, industry participants that come with that. Carl, what are you guys facing? When you look at an industry change, it's really three categories, and I think this fits well in this model. So it's what are the people and process and technology barriers and so at a high level, the people is around um, staffing, uh, expertise, and really cultures, cultures that can embrace change of this innovation that's facing us. Uh, around process can be business models. Um, there's issues with aligning cost of service with uh, return on investment. And then uh, technologies uh, is around, you know, what are the big disruptive technologies to yesterday's paradigm, because they're already here. And so that can include um, uh, intermittent generation, so renewables that uses a fuel source as predictable as sunshine and the wind. Uh, it's an increase in electric vehicles, uh, and it's an increase in distributed generation, just to name a few. Good. Brad, what's, what's ERCOT facing? What, what are the big challenges? <laughs> You've there's, already had a bunch that you've There's a number to climb of challenges, over. yes. Uh, so, uh, sticking with some of the same comments that you had, uh, we have got uh, a lot of entry of new type of technologies in the market. And accommodating those new technologies, and not just accommodating, but utilizing the specific advantages they bring, is one of the key focuses that we have. We've been looking uh, for the last several months at changing our entire ancillary services structure, one that we've had for the last 15 years to bring in more technologies such as solar, such as uh, storage, and enable those technologies to meet our needs in a way that could reduce our cost overall. So that's one focus we have. Additionally, one of the key challenges we have in Texas is something that most states don't face. We have a very vibrant growing economy and a vibrant growing electricity sector. Uh, the oil patch, for example, is growing in some areas 100% a year. So out at the edge of our system, we're having to keep up with that growth and continue to build transmission and distribution and make sure that we're able to model to meet that. Good. Rayford, welcome to Texas and tell us what we face. <laughs> what, are you, what kind of things did you bring with you that we're going to have to overcome? Yeah, well, I, I think the first is how we deal with the clean power plan. Uh, clearly that's affecting the generation fleet and what we're going to do, what we choose for resources going forward. I think the second um, is interoperability, interoperability of the grid. Clearly our customers want more out of the grid. They want to be enabled to do things. And the utilities themselves want interoperability. We're stuck buying very proprietary and siloed solutions and it's bad for us and bad for our customers. So we need to overcome those two things. I think the third thing is really the use of analytics. How do we and other third parties take the data from all these new systems and turn it into something of value for our customers? 
And interoperability is an interesting issue because the grid itself is perfectly interoperable. You know, I don't have to worry when I go down to Best Buy and buy an appliance whether it's going to work or not. I bring it home, I plug it in. Uh, I have a, some kids at home and I have a Wi-Fi and I noticed this morning on my dashboard uh, 27 items uh, on my Wi-Fi network from iPhones to iPads. Every one of those bought, brought it home, unwrapped it, plugged it in and it worked. It's pr probably nothing in the smart grid that I bring home, unplug, plug, unwrap, plug in and it works with everything else I've got. It's a, it's a huge issue. David Crane at NRG, one of the more uh, innovative uh, CEOs, and NRG is one of the more interesting sort of nationwide non-holding company IOUs, says when he thinks about the future, all he sees is opportunity. Christine, what are the opportunities that you think utilities have? Opportunities for utilities, well, I, I would I would answer that by also looking at our market holistically and also include the retail electric providers and the opportunities for them. Um, I think that with the, the, the technology that, that has been installed by our utilities from the meter on up and um, the integration of our uh, wholesale market with the retail market that we have and the enormous amount of data, customer data, customer usage information that's available. Um, what I think we're going to see is a real emergence of new participants, third-party providers that are going to support how services are provided to customers. We're preparing for that right now. Um, third-party, well, we have third-party access today, but the utilities are currently working on a project to add it and enhance how that's done. And then we're working at the commission on third-party um, rules with respect to DG, third party ownership of DG, and there's a lot of issues with that. So I think that's really where I see a lot of opportunity. So a th an example third party might be an internoc kind of entity. It could be an internoc, it could be a, a demand response provider, it could be someone, a company like a cable company that integrates customer, um, you know, entertainment with energy mm -hmm. use. Carl, what, uh, what, are you, what are the opportunities that you can't wait to get to at the city of Austin? Uh, well, I'm definitely an opportunities guy, and I see a lot of opportunities. You know, part of it is just the, the time and resources to, to pursue them uh, to fruition. Uh, so I'd kind of balance the opportunities in the same way I did the challenges. So regarding people, uh, one of the opportunities is better collaboration. And so, for example, I chair an advisory board called Central Texas Fuel Independence Project, and that brings together stakeholders who are working together more closely now that traditionally didn't. So it's not only electric utilities, it's policy, it's university, it's auto manufacturers, it's auto dealers, uh, it's um, electric vehicle service equipment manufacturers. And so really, once again, is we realize we don't have all the brightest ideas and to leverage that community. Uh, in process, uh, there's a lot of talk about sustainable energy and regarding process, I would like to really embed the thought about sustainable business models. Uh, so historically, yesterday's utility and still today's utility is a volumetric, you know, you, per KWH is what we charge for. Um, Although the vast majority of pricing is fixed cost, uh, fixed investments, and capacity investments, the, the actual volumetric uh, doesn't really reflect the value uh, that you're providing. And so uh, really looking at sustainable business models that allow more people to come into the market and be competitive in that market, and also to shift the us versus them and allow more utilities and more stakeholders to embrace these um, new technologies. And then lastly, on the technology front, uh, one is I, I am a big uh, proponent of the real opportunities on electric vehicles. Uh, electric vehicles, a lot in Texas is focused at the home is on air conditioning load. And electric vehicles draw more power uh, at peak, can have the potential to draw more power at peak, and have the potential to draw more KWH per year than AC. But the beauty about electric vehicles, one, it's also a lithium ion storage facility at these homes. Um, and two, people are generally more comfortable with maybe charging at night or off peak 
than they are with when they went their AC to run during a hot summer afternoon. So I think there's some great synergies there. Um, and another one is on demand response is, I mean, demand response is just a way to help try to adjust uh, the, uh, the load requirements. Um, I think there's a lot of great new operating demand response has been around for a while. Uh, typically the value has been around something we call 4CP. Um, and then that is the value on that for us that this year was about $41,000 per megawatt hour that we could shave off that. A couple years ago, it was closer to 25 or 30,000. So we're seeing that value of just peak shaving increase quite a bit. But the real opportunity from my perspective is not only capturing that shaving that allows a calculation on your 4CP, but what other ancillary services or market participation can you get into on your demand response to fully synergize or fully squeeze uh, all the value you can out of those programs. Good, good. So, what's the, what are the opportunities? Well, so Carl's stealing everything. So, yeah, yeah, I'm glad I'm right here. <laughs> yeah, I guess so, so, well, I looked at your so notes, cut by him, the way. Cut him off right a little bit early next record. time that you would, Steve. So let me hit some of the points you made. Uh, I think in terms of opportunities, DR is a huge opportunity in Texas. Demand response engaging customers in a way that they don't have to be active participants in the energy market. That's, that's where I see our future going. So right now I believe that we have roughly about 3,000 megawatts that is responsive in our system. Most of that is... That's out of a total of how much? Out yeah. of a total of on peak of 68,000. So a really small amount. So a really small amount relative to the size of our peak. Much of that is in emergency response. So they really don't even activate unless there's an emergency in the system. I would like to see customers moved into an economic realm. Now, we're not talking about having everyone on a variable rate. What I'm describing is that as we build tools into the market to allow a customer to respond to prices without having to know they're responding to prices. If we have smart thermostats or smart controllers of water heaters, those types of applications, we can have customers input a price point or give that control over to their retailer. It would say reduce consumption during these specific hours when it gets very high priced and ERCOT needs that type of response. That's where I see this market going. You talked about electrification of our transportation sector. I agree. I think that's where we are in about 20 years. As we move toward that future, and I think Bob Powell mentioned the same thing, as we move toward that future, we can manage the concern about cars charging on peak hours through our rate structures. And our rate structures coupled with these type of smart tools that would turn off that charging when prices get really high. So we don't have to have them turned off every day when it's, when it's warm out, but when prices get really high, they can respond automatically. And as you said, I think electrification of our transportation sector is an enormous advantage for us in Texas is we have so much wind, wind power that continues to develop. 12,000 megawatts is where we stand today in Texas, a little over 12. We are the largest state in the union. We are fifth if we considered ourselves a country, and many of those in the room do consider ourselves a separate country. We <laughs> are the Republic fifth, of Texas, for exactly goodness right. sake. We are fifth in the world in terms of wind power production. We can take that wind power that is predominantly in West Texas during nighttime hours and charge our vehicles. What an incredible way to utilize that renewable resource. Cool. So new to San Antonio, what are the, did they give you a list of challenges? Did they also give you a list of opportunities? What do you think? Yeah, I, I think one of the most interesting things that's going on in the space is the rise of what I call the lifestyle management. Uh, and really what that is, if you think about it, is it's managing within your home or your premise, uh, safety, health, energy, and entertainment. Um, really we see a lot of companies that are really coalescing around this sort of idea. Um, and to give you a sense of it, though, it's also a challenge for us. The opportunity is that roughly 31% of the average family of four, that's how much of their share of wallet gets spent on entertainment, safety, and health. Roughly 3% of it gets spent on electricity and gas. So if share of wallet equates to relevance, um, electricity, electric utilities, gas utilities, we're struggling for relevance in that space. Um, on the other hand, if we can find a way to make use of the data and the technology in ways that make it simple for customers to participate and find value and essentially attach ourselves to that lifestyle management, 
then I think we've achieved the opportunity that we're all talking about here, which is how do we turn what is a complex and difficult grid into something that has value and meaning for customers without making it too difficult for them to understand how to do it. Uh, and I really think that's the opportunity that we face. You know, it's interesting, the share of wallet. I mean, I'm an Austin Energy customer, even though I'm outside the city limits, out in Steiner Ranch. Pretty irritated with you guys. I mean, my last bill was 600 bucks. But at the same time, how much trouble am I willing to go to to even cut that in half? I mean, not a lot. I mean, I'm down here. I'm not at home. I mean. And how many devices do you have hooked up to your Wi-Fi? At any I know. Target? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Which I don't worry about unless they're off, and then I, I'm going to get paged by a daughter or a wife that something's not right. I want to come back to ERCOT for a minute. I'm going to start with you, uh, uh, Brad. We're cutting you out, Tom. <laughs> ERCOT, ERCOT is, a, is pretty much an island. We've got a weak tie to the north and a weak tie to the east. Will we can be an island 10 years from now? <laughs> That's an interesting question. I think the answer is emphatically no. We, we, well, rather, no, we will not change our current structure. Uh, ERCOT uh, was developed, uh, as our forebears in Texas would say, with a sense of independence that we've always had here. That independence, though, grants us a lot of advantages. By not being part of the larger federally regulated system, we can do things like the CREZ project that has occurred in the last several years. So let me talk to you about that. Most of you know about the Competitive Renewable Energy Zone project. This was essentially a project to rebuild by half again, by 50%, all of the major transmission in Texas and to build it up into the Panhandle region to pull down those wind-rich areas into our load zones. Seven billion dollar project. That could have never been done, at least at the speed that we've done it here, it could never have been done in the rest of the U.S. Another example is one that you're very familiar with, Christine, is the AMS meters, or smart meters in Texas. Roughly seven million customers now have meters which will enable them to engage in the types of things we just described. And that's out of how many metered customers? That's all. That's all. I mean, seven million, I think there's roughly about maybe eight million. You could probably tell me what the right number is. So that is such a larger fraction than the country, which oh, is less than 50%. It's enormous. Yeah. It is enormous here. And that means that our retailers in this state can engage customers in these types of programs, can put a, uh, a smart thermostat in the home, and the customer will benefit directly by that smart thermostat. Those types of programs can't be done in the rest of the nation with the type of speed that we've done. And those are the advantages that I think staying an independent grid affords to Texas. Interesting. I think also the ability to participate in the energy markets virtually via financial instruments. Mm -hmm. You can lay off some risk without actually moving a kilowatt hour across the border. Do the rest of you agree that you think the future holds still a, a, a Republic of Texas uh, grid? Christine, you have a? Huh. I, don't, I don't know that I could add anything on that piece to what <laughs> Brad already said, um, we're, we're not under FERC jurisdiction, I'm not going to predict whether that's going to change, but I wholeheartedly agree that we certainly have been able to act, I think, as a test bed here in Texas in the ERCOT footprint to try new things, and we have done a lot of things first, and, um, you know, learned as along the way and refined our policies and made improvements, and uh, you know, I think it's, it's good to let the states try out things first before you have national policies on things, whether it's infrastructure, cybersecurity, you know, how you regulate utilities, how you better incentivize utilities to do these things that I think everyone agrees are coming um, at some speed, DG microgrids, and we need greater demand response. Well, it's interesting how regulation can accommodate the realities of the market. I mean, I was working at Houston Lang and Power during the summer of the midnight tie. Mm -hmm. And the accommodation was, well, we'll consider a DC tie to be non FERC jurisdictional, mm -hmm. which is kind of interesting, you know, because there's still kilowatt hours flowing both ways between markets. So it, it, that's an interesting answer, Christine. Carl, do you have any thoughts on will we? I, there are two different issues. One is will we will we remain independent jurisdictionally. The other one is will we remain largely independent electrically. Mm. Uh, well, I, I find ERCOT uh, a fantastic partner 
And so maybe it's the t if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm, I'm really in support of my colleague's answer, sir. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Rayford? Well, so I'm, I'm new, and uh, I don't think that I've been fully indoctrinated into the Republic of Texas <laughs> yet. Uh, I still have my uh, North Carolina driver's license, at least for another week. Um, that being said, <clears throat> you know, I think there are advantages and disadvantages either way, and it's really more of a policy decision than anything else. Mm -hmm. um, and like Carl, if it ain't broke, why fix it right now? Christine, will there be a Public Utility Commission of Texas in 10 years? What will it look like? Yes, uh, we will. We uh, went through our sunset review last legislative session, and we have uh, we will be in place. Uh, the next sunset review will take place in 2023. What will it look like? Um, well, we just started this week. We welcomed um, additional staff members from the TCEQ that now work with us on water issues. Um, I tell people that we're relatively small compared to other commissions around the country. We do a lot with a very small staff. Um, and I just think that what, what, what will it look like? Our, we will continue to be pushing uh, the ball forward, whether it be uh, integration of um, new technologies into our market, um, greater demand response using, we have the advanced meters installed, and those have been, we've been fully deployed for, nearly fully deployed, I don't want to leave out TNMP, they're still um, wrapping up their deployment, but we've been deployed for several years, and so now we're kind of at the, it, uh, the next stage of the implementation where um, we use that technology at a different level, and I, I, we, the utilities do things in ERCOT today that I know that all the other, some of the other jurisdictions don't do. Um, providing the 15-minute data, that's a, a good thing. Um, remote reconnection 24-7, um, remote, um, a lot of things that required a truck roll, that was part of our process to, to do it remotely. And I think two different things. We have one utility that is um, about to start um, using um, the meters for load shed and rethinking how um, they respond if they're asked to by the ISO. So. I think just continuing to be forward thinking, I've been there nine years and I found the staff and the commissioners that we work for always to think outside the box and um, try new things. I don't think that will change. You mentioned the 15 minute data, Carl, I was on the phone with Austin Energy yesterday because my wife asked me, she says, okay, so I'm looking at our bill and the Austin bill is 3,123 kilowatt hours and the, or the August bill and the July bill was 33, 3,121. And in this period, we were gone on vacation for two weeks, and the thermostat was turned up to 90 degrees. Why are they still the same? Uh, so I get on the phone with one of your customer service representatives, and they go looking at my, and I've been kind of irritated that I've had a smart meter, but I get no smart meter data. He walked me through day by day, and he says, okay, you're using 47 kilowatt hours a day, and then bang, all of a sudden on this day, on July the uh, 12th, it jumps up to 150 kilowatt hours. I'm trying to think. Well, crap, that's when the, we noticed the water leaking in the ceiling because the coils had frozen up on the air conditioner and so it was running 24 hours and not cooling. Mm -hmm. And I go to the wife and say, uh, there's an explanation for that and that would have never been possible 10 years ago. It's pretty interesting. So where are you guys going? What, what does Austin Energy look like in 10 years? Well, in regards to that is, so the utility is involving where it wasn't that long ago, utilities didn't even use the word customer, you call ratepayer. Mm -hmm. Then we evolved to customers, where we're at now, and customer satisfaction as a metric. Where we're really moving forward now is customer experience, and that's where we want to improve your customer experience. So we do have a new mobile application that you can download and allows you to have a lot more uh, information uh, regarding your personal usage. Uh, so there's a lot of different programs and, and really a lot of these are targeting not only the current generation of users, but you look at the millennials and what they expect from any service provider, whether you're a utility or Apple or whatever, you know, they've been hooked up to the internet since birth, they all have smartphones, I mean, you look at that and that's just gonna be their demands and as they, you know, go through and get older and buy more electricity and have 27 devices hooked up uh, at any given time in their home, um, 
it's gonna be important to really understand and uh, cater to that customer experience. Um, I would say other major changes uh, for us. Um, one is, so we have very specific goals for 2020, and those are published. Uh, one is to achieve 35% renewable of our generation by 2020. Uh, fortunately, we were able to actually be ahead of schedule on that, so we've announced completion of that by 2015. And that's been enabled by a lot of uh, low cost, uh, mostly Texas wind power. So both CREZ zones and coastal wind, uh, as well as some pretty low price solar, utility scale solar projects as well. Um, we also have metrics just within the city that all city facilities will be 100% renewable. Uh, we achieved that in 2012, but part of that is also to be uh, carbon neutral on our fleets by 2020, and that's gonna take quite a bit more work to, to capture. So there's some things, we also have energy efficiency goals of another 800 megawatts. So that's basically a virtual power plant that we do not have to build. We'd rather invest in people's homes and personal savings with insulation and, and more efficient appliances and air conditioners to basically offset the investment cost of doing another uh, power plant. Um, so very specific goals. Um, they are achievable, they are aggressive, but they are achievable and we just keep pushing, uh, pushing the boundaries on those uh, to be reflective of what our community demands of us. And so that's one of the kind of nuances is of being a, a community owned or a city owned public power utility is our stakeholders is the citizens and what is their return on investment. So in addition to about 100 million a year transfer into the city coffers to help pay for parks and roads and things that people like uh, here. And a lot uh, of taxes, so you don't have to raise taxes. Yeah, I mean, that's, it's, it's a revenue stream, right. so it's a good investment for the city. Um, but it also allows us to do things that the community can be early adopters on and they want the utility to reflect their views and their culture. Uh, versus, so I think that's kind of a strategic advantage versus everything about, I come from the private sector. In the private sector, it's all about shareholder value. What are our quarterly numbers, the shareholder and metrics and all those kind of things. And it just drives a different culture. So I, I see us continue to be reflective of our culture, uh, reflective of our community with very aggressive goals and going after and achieving. Yeah. Brad, you've already uh, told us ERCOT will be around and it'll still uh, be uh, Electric, an electric island, but how will ERCOT be different in 10 years, you think? What new so, participants, what, what do you think will be different about ERCOT? So one area that I discussed was uh, engaging customers. That's a big part of what I think is going to be different. Uh, getting customers involved in participation in the electricity market through the types of devices that are available to them today. As an example, on a low load day, residential customers are less than half of the amount of load in our system. On a high load day, they're more than two thirds of the amount of load in our system. Much of that is air conditioning. Some of that's air conditioning with frozen up coils. That's right. 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 So that, I think that's a significant change we'll see in activity by customers in the economic side. Of What's the interface the between when you say ERCOT engaged customers? I mean, typically today you're dealing with your utility board, how are you, what's the interface between you and the customers? So I think the way the interface will probably work in the future, I know that, that, that Christine had mentioned third party suppliers is one option. Uh, another option is through their retailer. Mm -hmm. So the retailer, for example, I know that some are already doing this, will call up their customers the day before or send them an email the day before and say tomorrow from two to four, we think it's gonna be a high price period, it's gonna cost a lot of money, we'll share that savings back with you if you, you reduce your consumption. So that interface is through their representative, their retailer or their third party provider who will represent those offers into ERCOT. That's how I see that working. But the major change I see for ERCOT is really in the types of resources we have on our system. Wind has changed ERCOT dramatically over the last 10 years. You know, we're roughly at 10% of the energy produced is by wind resources. Uh, we've had days as much as 40% of the amount of energy we're serving wow. is from wind. And I said days, I meant hours, but there, much, there are some hours as much as 40% by wind. So as we see this type of penetration, we're getting prepared and making sure that we have the available resources to back it up, but there's more change to come. So an example is Texas is, and I'll throw out a number, I think it's roughly about 250 to 300 megawatts of solar. 
yet Texas is also one of the strongest states for solar potential. Now, if we compare that off against, say, Germany, they have 37,000 megawatts of solar. Uh, against California, and I don't know if Bob Powell's still in the room, but it's roughly around 6,000 megawatts of solar with 19,000 on the books. Yeah, and Germany's not that sunny. I mean, if you look at <clears> the Germany's solar not incidents, it's not exactly at the top. It is way down. Really, most of the, the solar area is down in the southern part of Germany <clears throat> in Bavaria. So it's not that sunny of a region. They have low capacity factors for their solar, but it's an incredible amount of capacity there. So I see great potential for ERCOT to be developing solar, and I think one of the leading examples is Austin Energy. I understand the other day from a news article that the city council has set a target for 2020 of 600 megawatts of new solar, and, and that would be at utility-based stations and 200 megawatts on rooftops. So that's already almost tripling what uh, we have currently in our system today if AE meets their goals. So across the region, I think we'll have a great degree of introduction of solar. And for ERCOT, the real change has to be in understanding where that is. It's easy for us to understand where the utility-based solar is. The rooftop, we don't have as much of an understanding of that. An example, I asked somebody from Los Angeles, the municipal, how much solar PV they had in their system. I have system. no idea. Yeah. He told me. Oh, they do? He said 2,000 megawatts. And I said, 2,000? How, How do you know that you have 2,000 megawatts? And his answer was, a rainstorm came over the city one day. <laughs> when the solar PV rooftop went away, they noticed they had 2,000 more megawatts of load <laughs> than they'd had before. Analytics, Christine. That's, That's the, the only analytics. way they knew. <laughs> <laughs> we want to be ahead of that. They want to be ahead of that as well. We want to be ahead of that. We want to understand where the solar PV is so we can plan our system ahead of those types of things. Well, and Brad, that's really interesting because if you think about the kinds of percentages that we're talking about and a storm comes over Texas, which occasionally happens over a lot of Texas fleetingly, that is a different operating scenario for ERCOT, isn't it? Very much it? Is. As an island. It so really that system is. awareness, I think, is very important to us mm -hmm. Rayford, you're the cleanup hitter. What do we look like in 10 years? Um, I, I think one of the biggest things is the use of information technology and telecommunications. Um, so much of what we have today is based on a centralized system and very high level analytics. And the enablement of all this technology and all this forecasting is really coming through the use of IT and telecommunications. That will enable customer choice. That will enable uh, capabilities we can't have today because we can't see the data. We can't see it at a granular enough level or as fast as we need it. But it's coming, and certainly this convergence between the OT world of generation and the traditional utility in the IT world of today, they're colliding, and sometimes in a messy way, but, but that sort of capability is what's enabling these, this understanding of where is solar, how can we best use it, where should we site it in the future, how can we take advantage and plan for it. Um, and things like the Clean Power Plan are also driving us in that same direction, which is how do we green our fleet? Um, how do we be responsive to our customers? Uh, I see these sorts of trends coming together and really being able uh, by the use of technology. As we prepare to, for the audience to ask us some questions, I want to make one observation. You know, that our customers, and you mentioned the millennials. I've done several panels around the country over the past year of millennials and asking them, get them in front of a bunch of us old folks and ask them how they live their lives. It's absolutely astonishing how, how they, they, you ask them, uh, when do you use your phone? Well, never. Or dad makes me call home once a day. No, they don't call. I asked a group of four of them in Nashville at a conference uh, earlier this year, when do you turn your phone off? All four of them looked at me like, never. One of them said, I don't know how to turn it off. <laughs> When we got off the stage, I said to her, so Catherine Ann, you're kidding, right? You don't know how, she didn't know how to turn it off. We showed her how you hold the button down and swipe it across. <laughs> she looked at me and she says, that's really good to know. <laughs> but our customers are connecting to the internet of things. That's where we're gonna find them. And this convergence of OT and IT, we're gonna be connected to the internet of things. But that's another panel. Do we have questions from the audience? Uh, I've done some research trying to, there's uh, some 75 electric co-ops in Texas, and I, I queried them and the uh, a cooperative association trying to get a sense of where the solar is out there, and, and it's very difficult to get that information. Uh, so 
would you like to hire me, Brad, to go out <laughs> and uh, do a survey of where the solar is in Texas? We, we could certainly do that. I, I think our preferred method is to go to the cooperatives and go to the transmission distribution providers and get them to gather that information. Most of them have that information available in some form. Right. We would like to improve the information they have by, for example, uh, it'd be nice to know whether it's westerly facing or southern mm -hmm. facing so we can know when we could expect to have that type of production. Uh, but those are steps that we're working through right now. Great. Um, also, the legislative uh, session is coming up here. Uh, I don't know. I guess ERCOT really can't go and lobby the legislature to pass pro-solar uh, legislation such as, say, Jose Rodriguez uh, Senate Bill 304, which would require uh, housing subdivisions, developers, and they're exploding, of course, all around Texas, especially Central Texas. Uh, Senate Bill 304 last session died in committee, uh, but it would require developers to offer solar, just offer, not, not require them to put it on, but just offer the solar option to uh, home buyers. Uh, can ERCOT or anybody, you know, put a little pressure on the legislature or committees, how does that work? That's it. Good, well thank you for your question and, and I think you answered it already. We're, we're not in the business of lobbying, but I will turn it to my compatriots to see if you have any thoughts on it. You guys regulate utilities, not customers, right? That's right. I mean, that's, yeah, it's hard to tell customers what to do, isn't it? Right. Yeah. Next question. Sure. Dave Tuttle, University of Texas. Brad, you're the most popular. Um, price is typically a good proxy for emissions level, but do you think we'll see, in addition to price, real-time price signals that are useful for many, enabling many of these new things we want, maybe some emission signals that ERCOT could, could have real-time that would allow the different utilities or REPCOs to offer, you know, different types of green packages? So do you think you'll have uh, emission signals soon? And then second, if you want to uh, talk about the utility-scale solar interconnect requests and are they exponentially growing or just a little bit? CREZ also enabled that, so I just want to hear an update on utility scale going on CREZ in West Texas. Very good, so I'll be glad to give you both. Uh, I've gotten a question a lot about having some sort of emissions related price signal. Uh, personally, I don't believe that's going to be necessary. Uh, the, the government, as they make policies on emissions, yeah. will drive that type of recognition in power prices. So if a, uh, if a coal plant needs to add new capital equipment, they're going to have to recover that through their prices. And so those economic signals will be there. On, uh, on the second issue uh, about, uh, help me out again. So the how, how's the interconnect request oh, going the for utility scale requests. solar? We are seeing uh, a number of interconnect requests, but it doesn't show a great ramp up at this time. Uh, we're seeing just a gradual ramp. Uh, we were very impressed by the contract that uh, Austin Energy just committed to uh, less than a year ago now. And, uh, and the types of prices that are coming forward in the market, it, it's very positive for the outcome of, of solar in the future. And my question goes from what Carl said earlier about how rates may change for customers. Um, I'm just curious if you could expand upon that um, as how, as you move more to, utilities move more to a you know, a grid management and maintenance sort of service uh, away from the being the, the uh, generation being the primary business model? Uh, yeah, I mean, that's a, it's an excellent question. Um, it, it, there's a lot of policy involved in that. Uh, really, our job is to be transparent and be able to articulate the cost of service uh, so the policy can align. Uh, but from a bigger picture perspective, I mean, you look at one of the comparisons is uh, traditional mobile phone usage. Remember when they first came out, you'd get charged by the minute, and then you'd get 100 minutes, and then more, and then 200, you know. Yeah, I mean, just think how outdated that business model feels today with most people with unlimited messaging and text, and it's just a You're little Essentially more. paying a fixed charge. I pay a fixed charge at my house. Yeah, basically. and yeah. so I see us being much more creative there because the value isn't the volume metrics. Uh, the cost and value and the investments, the majority is, it's just the capacity of just physically being hooked up in the infrastructure to support it. Um, so I think there's going to be a lot smarter minds than me of, of, of aligning those financial models with policy 
You also don't want unintended consequences. If you completely remove volumetric, well, are you still, how does that impact energy efficiency programs and uses and that kind of stuff? So there's, there's still a lot of debate to happen on that, but I do predict the whole KWH as the default method will be a, a donkey cart in the, in the past uh, within the horizon of our future. Sure. One more question and then we'll conclude. Uh, all right, so y'all touched on the, the whole subject of interval data access several times. And my understanding is that Smart Meter Texas is opening up to all third party access as soon as next month. But that information is still going to be anywhere between, call it 12 and 24 hours in arrears. Do you foresee in the future that will become more real time or will there always be that lag? So I'd like, I'd like to see it more real time, but I don't foresee it in the near future getting there. It's, uh, there's a significant requirement for the utilities to communicate that information if we're going real time. And right now it's batched up and sent in sure. typically once a day. So a lot of the real time, the, these smart meters don't can't get it to you real time. I mean, well, they, they some have, can, some can't. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, that's possible. That many of them can though, and and I think there's just a lag in that ability to communicate those. But we're continuing to look at that issue. It'd be nice to get to a future to where a customer could look at their home and discover immediately that they've got a problem with their air conditioner. Uh, we're not there just yet, and uh, I think that is something to look for in the not near future, but the future. Well, it's a big step that that information is just coming out even, even if it is a day in arrears. So it's a That's step cool. in the right direction. Thank our panel. Thank you, guys. Thank you.